الحمد لله رب العالمين حمد يوافي نعمه ويدافع نقمه ويكافئ مزيده فيا رب لك الحمد حتى ترضى لك الحمد بعد الرضا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك سبحانك لا نحصي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك فاللهم أخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا بنور الفهم وافتح علينا بمعرفة العلم وسهل أخلاقنا بالحلم وجعلنا مما يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه اللهم جعل أعمالنا خالصة لوجهك ولا تجعل فيها حظا لغيرك يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك فاللهم لا تحرمنا خير ما عندك بشد ما عندنا وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله رب العالمين فالسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته عزبران الحمد لله رب العالمين. So we continue and we're still reading Islamic contract law which we have differentiated from Islamic finance. And we said that Islamic contract law is based on the exchange of wealth. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to own certain things and there is a need for humans to exchange the ownership of certain goods as well as to extend to one another certain services in order for this to take place in a manner that doesn't cause fasad corruption on the earth Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made vehicles for these exchanges these vehicles is, are what we term as contracts and we said that in our classes over here which this is the sixth class I believe we will be discussing the sales contract and that is the exchange of the exchange of of two physical things or two commodities as such and we said that for a sale to occur and for its benefits to come about the main benefit which is the transferal of ownership for that to take place then certain components must exist in that sale and those components must exist in a certain way when these things come together, we have the benefit of a sale, right? And its effect, effects occur. We mentioned that the first of these arcan pillars or components or integrals are the contracting parties. We said that the contracting parties consist of the buyer and the seller. And we stipulated some conditions that the buyer and the seller, the contracting parties have to meet. We said that they must have unrestricted contractual capacity and explained what that means. We also said that there must be the absence of coercion without just cause. And we explained the different types of coercion and what that means. We also said that when we want to sell certain types of commodities, the likes of a Quran or Islamic books, then it is required that the contracting party in the form of the buyer must be Muslim. We also said that when we want to sell certain type of goods, for example, when we want to sell weapons, then we stipulate that the buyer must not be at war with the Muslims or belong to such a state. Right? Then we said that the buyer can either do this or the contracting parties can either get into this contract by themselves directly or they can appoint a proxy or an agent to do so right and then we extended this to machines thereafter we moved into the contracted item and we stipulated certain conditions for the contracted item and we said that the contracted item firstly consists of two things the commodity and its counter value and the most common type of counter, counter value will be that of money right then we said that the contracted item must be pure and when we mentioned its purity we said the essence must be pure right and if the essence is pure, but it is sullied with filth, impurity, then we will still allow that sale. We also said that it must have a utility. Then in relation to that utility, we said that it must have a tangible measure. If there's no tangible measure, it cannot be sold. If the utility can only be accessed in a certain quantity, 
then we will stipulate that that quantity must be met as a threshold for that thing to be sold. When the thing has a tangible value, then we look. Does the Sharia recognize that value? If the Sharia recognizes it, we allow it sell. If not, then not. And we gave musical instruments as an example for that. Thereafter, we said that it must be possible for the contracted item to be handed over. Right? And we explained what that means. Thereafter, we said that the contracted item must be owned by the seller or the buyer or the proxy. Right? So it must be owned by the contracting party or the person who's interact or, or the yes, or the person on behalf of whom someone is interacting in the form of the proxy. Right? Then we also mentioned that the contracted item must be known. They must have knowledge of the contracted item. By that we said that the person must have, or the contracting parties must have knowledge of the corporeal. And we meant thereby that they must see it. We extended this and we also said that they must know the specifications of it, right? especially if they don't see it, as well as the quantity. When all of this is known, we will allow the sale of the, of the contracted item. Right? Then we introduced, we brought forward a chapter that actually doesn't belong in the book of sales, and it is that of forward buying. And we noticed that most of the sales that we engage in, right, though we consider them to be conventional sales, they are actually only valid if we consider them to be forward buying sales. So we sketched out the general idea of the forward buying sale, and we explained how what we normally consider to be normal sales will actually be uh, configured as uh, forward buying sales, right? If we want it to be correct according to the Shafi'i school. What is that? Thereafter, we didn't say anything else. <laughs> right? So we get into the new lesson today, inshallah. There's quite a bit to cover, and it will take quite a bit of brain power to do so. So, inshallah, we switch on. Right? So the first discussion that we have on page number 37 is, our author, Muhammad Ka, asks us, is it permissible for the contracted item to be a usufruct and not a corporeal? Right? So to jog your memory, we said that a contracted item will have two parts. One of those parts will be physical, and one of those parts will not be physical. Right? The physical part would be the form, the thing that makes the contracted item up. Right? And we refer to that as the corporeal. Then there will be the benefit that is derived from that physical thing, right? And we refer to that as the, as the user fraud, right? Um, for example, you have a car, right? So the body of the car, with, along with its wheels, right? And all the other accessories, we will refer to as the corporeal. Then the car has a utility, for example, transportation, right? So here we are saying that the, the utility transportation is what we refer to as the user front. Another example, you have a house, right? So the house will have a physical structure in the form of uh, bricks, which will form a wall. Maybe you'll leave some gaps over there and you'll put some windows in, right? And then you'll have a door, etc. So that's the physical structure. We refer to that as the corporeal, right? The Ain. Then... You have the manfa, the usufra, and that is um, that the house can be used for accommodation, right? So what are we asking over here? We are asking that, is it possible for the contracted item to, instead of being the ain, the corporeal in and of itself, but for the contracted item to be the usufra, the utility? You understand that? So we are asking in the case of our two examples, can I sell the accommodation without selling the house? Can I sell the transportation without selling the car? You understand that? Does that make sense? Yes? <laughs> okay, so let's read. Dear honorable student, when you hire a vehicle for the duration of a week, 
Do you own the vehicle or the user fruct of the vehicle? Yuri, did you say they own the vehicle? All right. You return the vehicle after a week, and that means that you were not the owner of the vehicle. So what did you own? During that week, you owned what the jurists refer to as the manfa'a, the user fruct. That is the benefit or usage of the vehicle. And we will discuss hiring shortly, inshallah. This that's the difference between the essence of something and its user fruct. In other words, O oh student, the essence is the thing itself, and the user fruct is an, a, an idea attached to it. Right? So the user fruct is not real. You can't touch it, see it, smell it, right? But you can experience it, right? But you can only understand it in the form of an idea. You cannot separate it from the, from the, uh, from the ayn, from the corporeal. You cannot take the transportation from the car and give it to somebody. You cannot take the accommodation from the house and give it to somebody. You have to give them access to the physical thing in order for them to access the metaphysical thing. Right? So is it permissible for you to purchase a user fruct such that it is considered a contracted item? Right? So, um, okay, this example here, to be honest, is very daqiq. Right? It's not the most precise example because um, when we come to the definition of the sale, we'll come to realize that you're not actually, you are purchasing the, the user fruct, but because the purchase is um, time bound, it's limited, we won't refer to that as a sale. We'll refer to that as hiring. There is another case, however, wherein a person can purchase a user fruct permanently. They can purchase a user fruct permanently. For example, you have two houses, right, next to one another. And these two houses, they have a shared passageway, right? So both of them, you call that musha, right, shared wealth. So both of them own the right of usage. They don't own the road, but they own the right of usage. So one cannot bar the other. If somebody wanted to, if, if one of them wanted to build um, uh, an extended balcony, they would have to do so with the permission of the other because they own it together. So what if one of the two neighbors decided that they wanted exclusive usage thereof? Would it be possible for them to buy the user for it? Over here, we'll say yes. This is an example where the person permanently buys the user for it and it's not hiring. You understand that? Then that user for it, will be part of inheritance as well. You understand? So over here, Malana is speaking more about the hiring contract, and he wants to bring our attention to, to the, nature of the, the nature of the hiring contract. So is it permissible for you to purchase a user fruct such that it is considered the contracted item? For example, you purchase or were gifted a getaway at a holiday resort, but conditions do not allow you to go. Is it impermissible for you to sell this holiday, which is represented by utilities, including lodging and using the entertainment and leisure facilities? Right? So you have, you've, you, you've purchased a holiday, right? And that holiday uh, is a package, right? Uh, it consists of lodging, accommodation, right? And other utilities. You might be able to use um, communal entertainment facilities, pool, and the like. I say and success is from Allah. Were you to hire the resort, were you to hire the resort, then according to the hiring contract, you own the user fruct for that limited period and are able to let it out to a second party. And I know of no scholar who would dispute this in the case where there is no clear prohibition from the, from the lesser. Right? So if the person who is leasing uh, the, 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 the accommodation to you doesn't stipulate that you cannot uh, uh, sublet, then by default you're allowed to sublet. Meaning what? That you have purchased this accommodation in the form of the user fruct of this building for a month. Can you then sell 15 days of that month? Yes, you can. You understand that? Though um, there would be more nuance to that in, in common law, right? But by default, if you have a, if you have a commercial, if you have a, uh, uh, if you have a residential property, then 
if I understand correctly, the default law is that you cannot sublet, right? But if you have a commercial property, then by default you are allowed to, to sublet, and that would be conventional law. In the Sharia, we will make no distinction between a commercial property and a residential property, right? Unless the two contracting parties come to some agreed stipulation of uh, the, the, the uh, like non-allowance of, of um, subletting. You understand what subletting means? Subletting means that you rented the place, then you rent it to someone else. This is because hiring is the transfer of ownership of the user truck. It is thus permissible for you to hire this holiday to someone else. Mala makes another point. As for the case where you are gifted a holiday, then I opine that you are not permitted to sell it or rent it to someone else. This is because gifting is representative of permission for usage, and Allah knows best, right? So over here, we disagree with Mona on this one, right? Uh, I would go to say that gifting is, in fact, not permission, permission for usage. Gifting is the transfer of ownership in a non-commutative -commuta manner. Therefore, if somebody gifted you a holiday, I would go to say, according to the Shafi'i school, that you could then hire that holiday out to someone else. Why? Because this is, a, this is one of the clearest meanings in the Sharia. If I gift you this book, I'm not allowing you to use it. I'm transferring the ownership to you without an exchange. Right? So you call that mutabarri'at. It's a charity. It's a non-commutative transfer of wealth. You understand that? So this mas'ala over here, that's the, and Malana will change it. Right? We had, a, when we were discussing, the, we had a discussion about it, and uh, I wrote here in the footnote, whilst editing this volume, the author of the Arabic original expressed a possible revision regarding this conclusion. Another configuration of the case would be to say that the user frac is a gift and is thus owned by the recipient. The understanding about, um, the understanding would imply that the recipient, that is the one gifted the voucher by the initial owner, is the guest um, of the original owner and thus has permission for usage and not ownership and Allah knows best, right? So what Malana is saying over here in that the person cannot sell the user frak when he's gifted a holiday, right? This would, be, this would be true if the person had a holiday house that he owned and then he allowed you to stay in that house. So if a person has a holiday house and they own it and they say, you can stay in my holiday house, now, they are, not lease, they are not leasing the holiday house to you. Rather, they are gifting you a stay. Right? And when they do that, they are not relinquishing ownership. Rather, they are giving you permission for usage. So in that case, you will not be allowed to sell it. As for the case where a person gives you a voucher for something that they don't own, right? Then they are transferring, they are gifting you the the, the, the ownership of that user frack for the limited time. So over there you will be allowed to sell it, and Allah knows best. So you can draw a distinction between the two cases. I think when Malna initially wrote it, then he thought about it in, in, in relation to that, but that's, uh, that's uh, how Malana wrote the mas'ala, and uh, that is sort of my position on the mas'ala if you want to. Um, so is that understood? So what did we say now in essence? We said that when we look at something, then that thing has two parts. One of the parts are physical, right? And one of those parts are metaphysical or not physical. Uh, the physical part is called the corporeal. The metaphysical part is called the user frack. We ask ourselves the question, can I, instead of selling the corporeal, sell the user frack? We said yes. And we gave an example of that, where the user frack can be sold permanently. For example, shared usage of a passage. Then we said that, what if a person does not per want to sell the user frack permanently, but he wants to sell it for a limited time? That will be facilitated by a different vehicle, a different contract called hiring. Right? In the case of hiring, the person owns the user frack in the period in which he is hiring. So, 
By default, the person will be allowed to sell that entire period or parts of that period in the form of subletting. As for the case where a person owns the user front and it gives someone else access to the usage thereof, not in lieu of a price, meaning for free, then that person does not have ownership of the user front. They have a right of usage and they cannot sublet and they cannot sell. Make sense? Fine. So now we get to the user is contracted item. Gaudi. La ilaha illallah. Muhammad is out. <laughs> so we get to the users. The user is contracted item, right? So I'm going to read the I'm going to read the beginning here for you. All the previous preconditions for the contracted item were in the, were in the case where it is not a user's item. Right? As for the case of it being a user's item, the Messenger وسلم, stipulated some other preconditions, the details of which will follow shortly. <clears throat> right? So now the author is going to categorize types of contracted items. So in general, when you are speaking about the physical contracted item, right, then you will have two broad categories, users and non-users. When the contracted item is non-users, then we only stipulate the conditions that we mentioned before, and there were five, right? When the, when the contracted item is users, then in addition to what we have stipulated before, we will stipulate either two or three extra conditions, right? And these conditions are tied into sometimes the quantity and at other times the nature of the sale. You understand that? So, before explaining these preconditions, allow me to say, O oh, noble student, that whatever Allah instructs us with, be it the obeying of a command or abstaining from a prohibition, then it is possible. Firstly, to understand, and secondly, to act upon. The same applies to interest, usury. It is not exempt from this principle in any way. What may be difficult for the duty-bound person to understand is not the core discussions regarding interest, but certain intricate and obscure matters that most people do not know. Uh, you, so, there's a very important point that Mala is making here, saying what, that oftentimes, oftentimes, when it comes to usury, right, then people have many excuses. Oh, but it's difficult, conventional banking, this way, that way, right? So that's why Mona is making this remark and he's telling us what? That if Allah tells us to do something, it's possible. Finish. If Allah tells us to do something, it's possible. Why they say? Because at taklifu bima la yutaq muhal. For Allah to make a person duty-bound for something that they have not the capacity for is meaningless. And we don't ascribe meaninglessness to Allah and His actions. You understand that? So if Allah instructs us to do something, then it means that it's possible for us to do that. Right? And if there is a misunderstanding or a difficulty, then that difficulty oftentimes will not be regarding the core of the matter. But it will be regarding certain peripheral issues. Right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala erects experts for us to understand those issues through. Right? And we'll see when we get to murabaha, right? Which is a kind of financing that one of the excuses that people make is that, oh, it's the same as conventional banking. It's the same thing. It's the same contract. Right? It's just a scam. So this is jahl. This is what? This is jahl. This is ignorance. Right? Many of those who speak this, they haven't even read a contract. Right? And if they read it, they don't have the legal mind or capacity to understand it. Right? So it's not befitting of the Muslim to speak of that which they don't know. And if a person doesn't know something, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Then ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. Right? And on this matter and other matters, they are the, the ulama, they are the experts in this. They are the 
the experts in this. So what exists in terms of options where Islamic finance is concerned, these are models that the scholars, many scholars, have spent hundreds, and I will even say thousands of hours in crafting this. Imagine you have an entire system that is going against the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you have a group of scholars that within that system, they have crafted for you a path. I would say more miraculous than the splitting of the ocean for Musa alayhi salam. A, a path where there was no way. Inna la mughraqoon. That's what the people were saying in the 1950s. We are drowning. There's no path besides death. And for this, the scholars split the sea of usury and they made the path of Islamic finance so that people can be out of war with Allah and they can find themselves in the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is with regards to these efforts that people say, this is the same as usury. La ilaha illallah. And to equate that which Allah has prohibited with what Allah, with, with what Allah has made halal, this is kufr. This is disbelief, right? And this is not my opinion. This is the opinions and understandings of the scholars. insan. So let the person be careful when they speak about these matters because these matters are serious. If you don't know what's, what exists in the contract, don't speak about it. Ask. And beware of being a questioner that comes with pride. I know better this. Why is the prices the same? Why is the? These are all peripheral issues. The core issue is that these scholars have spent a good portion of their lives crafting these options in a world that doesn't want you to obey Allah. And the person who goes against this, they don't want to obey Allah. Right? They're not, they're not prepared to, to go against the grain. So every one of these contracts that we speak about, then a person must take it upon their heart that this is how Allah wants me to exchange wealth. And I want to exchange wealth the way Allah wants me to exchange wealth. And this must be the mindset of the person who approaches any of their monetary dealings. That I want to be within the law of Allah. When a person decides this, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make the way easy for them. Right? And alhamdulillah, now in the world there is what? There's movements like conscious capitalism, for example, where you find that even non-Muslims are looking towards these Islamic finance options and finding them to be more ethical. They are looking at these, 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 these cooperative insurance models, right? That have existed for hundreds, more than a thousand years in the Islamic legacy, and they are finding this to be more ethical than conventional insurance options, right? People are moving towards this. But the mindset of the modern Muslim is what? Is that the West must first put a stamp on something before we can see value in it. Allah stamped these things 1400 years ago. More than 1400 years ago, Allah stamped the efficacy and the moral supremacy of these laws. We are waiting for bankers in the West to stamp our things, to say that this is moral, this is ethical, this is good finance. We're waiting for Adam Smith, Mandresh, right? This is not the way of the believer. This is not the way of the, the believer. And this is not my sentiments. This is the sentiments of the scholars that have tirelessly worked to make this available for the people. There are people, when people said, you know what? I'll just take out the house on, on uh, I'll just take a loan from the bank. There were people whom, when they knew that people were taking these decisions, they couldn't go to sleep at night. The likes of Sheikh Abu Bakr from Malaysia, right? Some people also that are tirelessly working day and night, Mufti Taqi Uthmani and many other names, no? That a person can mention in this regard. So it's a very important topic. The, this is, there are, there are many sins that a Muslim can commit. Right? But um, only two sins come to mind wherein Allah says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is at war with him. 
Man adha li waliyan faqad adhantuhu bil harb. Whoever hurts my friends, then I'm at war with them. That's one. The second Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, right, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns that person who doesn't stay away from riba, fa'adhanu bi harbi min Allah. Then beware of a war with Allah. Who wants to be at war with Allah? Rabbu samawati wal ard. The Lord of the heavens and the earth. If Allah wants to in this moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can turn the earth on us. Who wants to be at war with Allah? Right? So these matters are not to be taken lightly. Right? And these solutions, right, wherein we can practice the law of Allah, we have to be extremely grateful for these solutions. And we have to give the scholars their due. If we find loophole, if we find uh, uh, challenges in it, or we find difficulties in it, or we find holes in it, then we have to say, how can we improve this solution? Right? This must be our mindset. How can this solution be closer to the law of Allah? How can it be more beneficial for the Muslims? How can we advance morality within, within finance? And I can promise you, it's not going to take place via our continued commitment to the banks and their systems. Right? So coming back to the clause, the user is contracted item. So when it comes to the user is contracted item, then we'll find that, and it's important, let's say for the next 10 minutes, stay a little bit focused, we'll, we'll put them in two groups. Right? We'll put them in two groups. Then in each group, we'll put some categories. In each group, we'll put some categories. Then we'll explain that there are certain ways of trading across groups and within groups. You understand that? Kind of makes sense? That's like the theoretical framework. So let's get to the practical. Thereafter, I say, it is established through legal texts that there are six categories of user as commodities. These six categories are divided into two groups. The first group consists of two commodities, gold and silver. So we have group one. In group one is gold and silver. The second group consists of the remaining four commodities, which are grain, wheat, dates, and salt. So group number one, gold, silver. Group number two, grain, wheat, dates, salt. Group number one, group number two. Right? So if you were to sell one of these categories for a like category, such as gold for gold, or silver for silver, or grain for grain, etc., then it is stipulated that the sale take place meeting three conditions. You got that? So now you have, in group one, you have two categories. If you sell same category for same category, then you have to meet three conditions. In group two, you have four categories. If you sell same category for same category, you have to meet three conditions. So gold for gold, or wheat for wheat. Three conditions. Hand to hand. Number one is hand to hand. That the sale be cash and not credit. That the sale be cash and not credit. Right? Meaning that the contracted item, be it the commodity or its counter value, cannot be delayed from the time of the contractual setting. Cannot be deferred. Right? So if I have, um, let's see what we have here. Okay. So. Um, let's consider this to be 50 golds, and let's consider this to be 50 golds. So if I'm selling 50 golds for 50 golds, then I cannot bring this 50 in 10 minutes time. In the contractual setting, for example, Ibrahim is sitting here, right? So Ibrahim and I are sitting in the, in the contractual setting. Ibrahim will have to have the money or, let's say, the gold, with him in the contractual setting, if he wants to engage in this contract. Make sense? That's what we call hand-to-hand. -hand. It's going to take place cash. The second thing is like for like. It is stipulated that there be uniformity in amount. So 50 for 50, 51 for 51, right? So if it's grams, then grams. If it's kgs, then kgs, etc. You understand? This means that you are not permitted to sell one gram of gold except in exchange for one gram of gold. 
Keep this in mind, O oh noble student. And do not be hasty and ask yourself, why would somebody buy gold for gold in the same quantity? Right? For certainly the wisdom behind legislating the impermissibility of this will become clear to you during the course of the study. So specifically at the mention of the wisdom behind prohibiting usury in conventional sales. Right? So a person will say, why does a person sell gold for gold in the same quantity? Right? There are many reasons. A person might want to sell a nugget for a coin. The person might want to sell uh, an amount that has been uh, uh, manufactured into jewelry, right? Or an ornament, right? For coins, etc. Right? So it must be like for like, meaning the same amount. Number three, taking position before parting ways. Right? You call this taqabub. You call it taqabub. Right? So that is to say, after the two preceding preconditions have been met, in that you sold gold for gold, cash and not credit, in equal amount, it is impermissible for you, if you want the sale to be valid, to leave the contractual setting where we are until reciprocal handing over of the contract item has taken place. You understand that? So that means that the money is present in the contractual setting in that Ibrahim has the 50 goals and I have the 50 goals, right? We conclude the sale uh, in that he makes an offer, I accept the offer, right? But now we go our ways. You say, so you know what? Bring it to the car. If he walks with me to the car, that can work. But if he goes to the car and he tells me, you know what? Bring it to the car. Won't be. It won't be permissible. You would have fallen into usury. You understand that? Though, if this was a conventional sale, it would have been no problem at all. It would have been no problem at all. You understand that? Five. So, that is when I'm selling one user's commodity for another user's commodity in the same group and the same category. Gold for gold. What if I'm selling in the same group, group one, gold and silver, but I'm selling gold for silver? So, same group, different category. If, however, you were to sell one category for a different category within the same group, such as gold for silver or grain for wheat, then two preconditions are stipulated. That it be cash and not credit, that the contracted item is taken possession of before parting ways. So here you see that it is not stipulated that the quantity be the same when the categories of the user's item differ. Right? So if he sells gold for silver, then I can sell 50 for 20. You understand that? I'm selling gold for silver, then I can sell 54, 20. There can be a discrepancy in amount, but the other two conditions of it being cash and it being handed over in the sitting applies. You understand that? Now. Okay, so you understand that. Now. Um, okay, Mala is going to give a proof for this. All the preconditions we have mentioned for the user's commodity are encompassed by the noble prophetic hadith with more precise and simple wording. This is page number 41. How can it be otherwise when he was bestowed miraculously concise and comprehensive speech? The Prophet says, gold for gold, silver for silver, grain for grain, wheat for wheat, dates for dates, salt for salt, like for like, cash for cash, hand to hand. If these categories differ, then sell however you wish when it is hand to hand. Make sense? So that's all that we explained now. The Prophet Hassan explained it in one, <laughs> one line, right? Type. So we're not the uh, Prophet. Type. Okay, let me get you into the next discussion. I thought you would be able to finish it. Um, but I went on a bit of a rant. I apologize for that. Um, not for the meanings, just for the time. I intended the meanings. So the next will say, is usury confined to the six categories mentioned or not? So now we, we see that in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ explicitly mentions these categories. Is it now that these are the only things which the laws of usury will apply to? 
Or can we extend this ruling via one way or another? You understand the question? Uh, so, he says that rather it extends to other types, we're on page 42, the second paragraph, rather it extends to other types of wealth which share the same ratio legis. The ratio legis of the first group is that it is counter value or in modern terms, it is currency. So in group one, we notice that gold and silver, they both share in the same uh, illa. The illa is the ratio legis. Right? The reason for it being used is. And what's the reason? It's a currency. Right? When we look at the second group, then we find that it shares in the fact that it's foodstuffs, particularly staple, staple foods. Right? So now I'm going to give you another example. It says, so when you travel to perform Hajj or Umrah, for example, you go to the currency exchange to sell rands for reals. This is the sale of one currency for another and the sale of one user's commodity for another, which is subject to the conditions of selling one uh, category of usury for, for another within the same group. It is thus permissible for you to sell rands for reals, provided that two preconditions are met, that it be cash and hand-to-hand, -hand. and it is permissible for the quantities to differ, so you can currency exchange. You can thus sell 1,000 rands for 700 reals. Got that? Additionally, were you to go to a mall and sell rands, handing it over to the buyer, then you continued shopping and took possession of the reals after completing your shopping, that would not be permissible, due to handing over before exiting the contractual sitting, not having occurred, or having not occurred. You understand that? So you have to take the money immediately. You have to take the money immediately, right? Okay, I think we are going to have to leave this discussion sort of halfway. Um, but possibly the, ex the discussion will be extended via the questions and then um, we'll try to cover the rest tomorrow, inshallah. So we suffice with that and then we open for questions, inshallah. It wouldn't be possible for you to permanently sell the user fract of a software. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong on that, because that's got nothing to do with Islam. That's got to do with software. But I'm making a claim. And the claim is that it's not possible for you to separate the utility from the software and sell the utility only, permanently. You understand that? So you can hire the software, but you cannot sell it. You can sell the software, but you cannot sell the utility of the software without the software. You understand that? So, let's consider this. Let's consider a subscription to actually be the hiring of the user fra, via which they have to make over to you the corporeal, which is digital. Then, if they stipulate that you cannot give it to a second party, it will be haram for you to pirate it. If they sell you the software, in the case we were speaking about sales, he's asking a different question. We're speaking about the fact that the person owns the software, right? Now, can they, can they pirate it? Of course. Here's a different condition. You have a subscription with the software, meaning that they're giving you a right of usage. Then they stipulate that you cannot hire it to a second party, or give access to a second party, right? So that would be akin to a type of subletting, which in certain cases we will allow that stipulation. So over there we'll say that they won't allow you to pirate it. They won't allow you to pirate a subscription software. You, you see the difference between the two? Time. <laughs> uh,
reading the Bible the same night that you played it last night. I don't understand why my confession is given now today. I can read it yes. Okay. So Perhaps what will help you in this regard is a definition. When we say cash here, what do we mean? We mean that it must be settled immediately. The payment cannot be deferred. That's cash. You understand? Credit means that the payment is deferred. This is cash. That's not the cash that we're talking about. The cash that we are speaking about is not um, a noun. It's a verb. Or, worst case scenario, it's a gerund, a verbal noun. No? It's the act of giving immediately, juxtaposed to the act of not giving immediately. You understand the difference? That's important to understand. It's good. We'll put it in the edit. Maybe a footnote will help. For example, uh, a guy comes, obviously, uh, in his special stay, he's in a stay, in a, he stay, and let's not say a magic is walk off, say, Salah, I know you know. Mm. Now, you, you, can, you give him, say, a week to stay, it's, it's free, no, no pay. Mm. But after three days, something comes up. An opportunity, but in that before the three days, an opportunity comes for him to to uh, to leave. He asks if another friend can stay with him. Mm. Right? So now, actually, no, no, he doesn't ask. He says, "I got another opportunity, but can a friend of mine stay in my place?" Mm. In that case, we can't do that right? because the, the, it was gifted to him. He, he can the condition. I understand what you're saying. So the question is, um, let's say I have a lodging, right? And I permit somebody to stay in that lodging for free, for a period of five days. Before the five days elapse, says, right, let's say there are two days remaining. Can that person then say, look, they allowed me three day, five days. I only uh, used three of those days. So I'll bring a friend for the next two days, right? So at the end of your question, you said, what if he asks? If he asks and you say yes, no problem. But if he doesn't ask, he won't have the right to put someone in his place. All right? Is that understood? I don't understand. I don't understand the question. The, the, the question is a complicated one because it's too general. That, uh, because there are different, mo there are different models of, of, of home financing. For example, there's a, there's a musharaka mutanaqisa, you know, a diminishing partnership. There's a there's mudaraba, you understand? Um, there are no two, three, four different types of models. 
You understand? So the question is a very general question. And then also, you are not informing me of the specific conditions that they're telling you to meet. So, I, 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 like, I honestly, I don't understand the question because it's too general. So we would have to look at the specific conditions in order for us to uh, determine whether or not those will be acceptable shara'an or not. You, you kind of get what I'm saying. Hmm. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> oh, why I'm laughing is because um, with your initial payments that you make, the clever, the clever thing is that you initially buy a, a, a small percentage for a very big amount. And that's how the, that's how the bank uh, covers themselves. In that you think that the price is two, you think that the price is two million, for example, and now you're required to give, uh, let's say you're giving 250,000 as a down, down payment. That 250,000, so let's say 2 million, um, that will split it into 16 parts, isn't it so? 2 million, 250,000, we'll make it 16. One sixteenth. An eighth, right? An eighth. Two, 2 million, one eighth, yeah. An eighth, right? So an eighth. Would give you how much percent, Akram? Roughly. About 12.5 percent. But as I understand these models, they won't give you 12.5 percent. They might sell that initial portion and they might give you like 0.5 percent. They'll sell that share to you at that amount. You understand that? So, that means that you think that you own a big portion of it, but you have to read like the fine print. You understand? So, so in actual fact, you don't own a big portion of it because they can, they can sell a share for at any price they like. They can sell a small share for a big price and then a big share right at the end with your last 15, 20,000. They can sell 99% or they can sell 95% for that 15,000. You understand that? So, so you must understand where the bank is coming from. The bank is coming from the perspective that in conventional, like debt financing, the bank doesn't have to buy the house. They don't have to put any money down. But when we go via the Islamic model, then we, the legislators from the side of Islamic finance, say that you cannot sell something that you don't own. Therefore, we necessarily pressurize the bank to buy that. So now the bank has set itself up, right, for a financial risk that no conventional bank has to set themselves up for. So now the, they have to sh sell these shares for this. Why? Because there's, there's an amount, the, the, there's a risk that they're taking that the conventional bank is not taking. You, you understand that? So the same thing with the, with the Mudaraba model. There are risks that the, bank, that, that the bank opens itself up to in the Islamic contract model that it doesn't open itself up in the conventioning model. Why? Because here we're not allowing debt, right? And we're not allowing you to sell the house before you own it. So, so there's, there's, there's two major financial hoops that the bank has to jump through in order to get you that house in a halal way. Therefore, the process is going to be a little bit more complicated and it's going to be a similar price, if not sometimes more, on account of the, the, the it's much more risk. You, you understand that? I hope that brings it a little bit closer to you. Bye.
Uh, you see, the, 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 that's not the problem, or, or that's not the challenge. The challenge is not the, the installments, the challenge is the down payment. The challenge, the challenge is not the installment, the challenge is the down payment. Because uh, let's say you want to buy us for a million, the seller could give us 150,000. Let's say you want to buy two million, or say maybe give us 250, 300,000. You understand that? And when you go to the conventional bank, they tell you, look, no problem. We'll add the, the transfer fees and all that, which is like up to maybe 60, 70,000, right? All of that, they'll say, you know what, man? We'll just include it in your, uh, in your, in your fee, and then you, you can just start paying your 15, 20,000. You understand? Um, but obviously, that comes with a major war of our Lord. You understand? Um, but these, the, 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 the Islamic banks are still, they're still struggling to compete. And the Islamic financing models are still struggling to compete because um, conventional banks make money out of thin air. The, the money that they're using, like the debt promise, it doesn't exist. For us, the money has to exist and the ownership has to exist in order for us to establish the contract which is completely against the grain of the world, right? Now. Yes, the cost per share is different. Same like the bank. The bank has more risk than you because they bought a house with their money. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'd rather choose this than <laughs> Now you're getting it. <laughs> now I, I understand the complexities of it, and uh, and the, at ease, it's it's a you, it's it's an emotional thing to go through. I understand that, um, but this is the world that we live in, and these are our challenges. But if we, if more of us buy into it, and then we give more power to, you know, these models, and then they can, when more assets become available to them, and it's, 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 it's not, because it's not debt financing, it's cash financing. So the more cash they have, the easier they can make the financing. Um, so inshallah, may Allah make these models grow, inshallah, from strength to strength. Uh, maybe we'll take a last question. Mashallah, Akim Salam, are you? No, I'm glad to see you. Where is the other guy, Gil? Wow, oh, that was loaded. <laughs> I'm just joking, carry on. Hmm. So, you weren't here for the first class. <laughs> we got the three, man. Hmm? Did you cut this three? Yeah, inshallah. It's going to be a bit long. Inshallah.